Let's begin reading together Matthew 28 at verse 16. We'll read to verse 20. I'll give you the introduction and we'll move into our study. Matthew writes, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Last time we were together, we had spent time looking at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to begin my introduction by reminding you, or perhaps instructing you, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the uh, chief cornerstone, if you will, of the Christian faith. Because if you remove from our faith the resurrection, you actually empty our faith of its reality. In other words, our faith becomes useless. It becomes worthless. The Apostle Paul taught us that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 through 17. Paul said, if there is no resurrection of the dead then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins." So everything in our faith centers on the reality of the death of Christ, his burial, and his resurrection. Because if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then our preaching is built on a lie. But our faith is completely built on the fact of the resurrection, and there are several reasons why. Let me lay these layers for you now. One, Jesus made consistent statements that he would be raised from the dead. He said it over and over again in his teaching, beginning in John chapter 2, at the beginning of his ministry. In John chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So from the beginning, Jesus Christ was saying that he would be raised from the dead. As we've gone through Matthew, he mentioned that very specifically in chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 20, and chapter 26. He spoke about being betrayed, judged, crucified, and resurrected. So, if Jesus was not resurrected, then one, he lied to us. Secondly, the divinity of Jesus is proven by his resurrection because Jesus claimed to be God in human flesh, and his resurrection validated that claim. In John 5, 17 and 18, Jesus was being questioned about this, and Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I've been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. In John 19, verse 7, when the Jewish authorities were standing before Pontius Pilate, and Pilate was speaking to them, it said, The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. In Romans 1, verse 4, Paul said Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection validates his claim to be the Son of God. And all you need to do is think for just a moment about a young girl, maybe 14 years of age, who went off to visit one of her relatives in a distant town. And when she returns home, she's found to be with child. And her betrothed husband, Joseph, is concerned and begins to think, how can I put her away? But I don't want to do it in a public fashion because... If I make it known that she has become impregnated by another man, she could suffer capital punishment for this. 
And Joseph, being a just man, wanted to put her away privately. But the angel spoke to Joseph and said, Don't be afraid to take unto you Mary your wife, for that which she is carrying with her and that which has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. And this is the Son of God. And so all of her son's life, Mary, the mother of Jesus, wore the stigma of being a woman in her culture who became pregnant before they had officially made that marriage proper in the eyes of the people. And yet she had been saying this was a, a miracle baby all the way until the day Jesus was resurrected. She was regarded as a woman of no honor but when Jesus was resurrected, it verified every claim that this woman ever made concerning how she became pregnant. He was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection. A third thing, our personal justification rests on his resurrection. Paul in Romans 4.25 said, Jesus was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. A fourth thing, our salvation depends on his resurrection. In Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it's not simply saying, I believe that there was a Jesus 2,000 years ago. It's that I have a, my faith resting on the fact of his resurrection. And then fifth, our own resurrection rests on whether or not Jesus was raised from the dead. Romans 8, 11 says, If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he who raised up Christ from the dead shall also make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit who dwells in you. So, his resurrection is the center of everything that Jesus taught concerning himself, and his entire ministry rests on whether or not he was raised from the dead. Because that's true, Satan obviously has worked overtime to undermine the reality of his resurrection. But he is alive, and because he lives, we live also. As we look at this passage, we see that Matthew is concluding his entire story of Jesus Christ with what is called the Great Commission. It says to us here as we begin, verse 16, that the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, some doubted, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. So we're looking at this great commission. Now, this commission is not only found in Matthew. It's also found in different ways in the other Gospels as well as the book of Acts. When you look in the other Gospels and Acts, you see that each portion of Scripture speaks of, of it in a different way. It actually adds elements. You see the commission given in, in Mark 16, uh, verses 15 through 20. You see it given in Luke 24, verses 46 through 49. You see it in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 21 through 23, as well as the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. What we have here in Matthew uh, are the elements that we're going to be looking at concerning the commission as he, as he gives it to us. And uh, Matthew is going to make it clear that the mission is to preach the gospel and to make disciples. You see, the Great Commission is, is not to fill buildings up with people. The Great Commission is to fill people with Jesus Christ. And today, sadly, great masses of professing Christians have missed that point. They only interpret the message of the gospel as, as long as it, its message pertains to their particular needs. And, and it escapes them that they actually have been given a mission of supreme urgency. You see, Jesus made it clear that his followers to give this message to the world. And that's because all are lost without him and everybody needs to come to him. All people need Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. In Acts 4, verse 12, it says, There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on to save them. So the gospel reveals God's love for us as well as the offer of redemption. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, and the Bible says that people need salvation. They, they need brand new lives. They, they need the experience of forgiveness. They, they need that new start. And when we're saved, we are actually compelled by love and duty 
to take this message to other people. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.14, Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. In 1 Corinthians 9.16, he said, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast. I am compelled to preach. Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. So all of this is built on the teaching of the word which produces disciples. And I'll give you more insight as we go through this in just a moment. So what we have here in verse 16, again, is the 11 disciples. They went away into Galilee, which is northern Israel, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Very simply put, notice there are no longer 12. It's the 11. They all began well, but not all finished well. Judas the traitor is no longer counted as one of the 12. And they went, according to verse 16, to Galilee. Notice to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Now, this is something I, I, I look at these things sometimes and I ask myself, how often did Jesus actually give messages from mountains? And you might find it interesting. Jesus actually gave a, a number of messages and did an, an awful lot of ministry around mountains for some reason. It, it's where he gave what is called the Sermon on the Mount. You see that in chapter 5 through 7 in Matthew. It was on a mountain that he chose his 12 apostles, according to Mark 3.13. The feeding of the 5,000 took place at the foot of a mountain in John 6, verses 3 through 6. The transfiguration occurred on a mountain, Matthew 17, 1 and 2. He wept over Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives in Luke 9.37. He gave the Mount of Olives discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. Later, he's going to ascend to heaven from the Mount of Olives, according to Acts 1.12. But here he gives the Great Commission, and he does so on a mountain. And they meet him at the mountain. And this is more than likely a place they're familiar with. Some commentators believe that this may be the Mount of Transfiguration, which would be appropriate, because he had spoken to them about seeing his glory. Now, he had promised to meet them in Galilee, according to Matthew 26.32. It would seem that Jesus had placed had a place picked out for them. And so the disciples are at the place that he called them to. One basic little thing here, simple obedience places them into the position of usability. Simple obedience. All you need to do is show up where the Lord wants you to be. And when the Holy Spirit begins to bring you to a place and you begin to show up at that place, guess what God's gonna do? He's gonna use you. You need to remember that ability is not as important as availability. And so as they gather there, notice verse 17, they see him and they worshiped him, but some doubted. So the moment Jesus appears, his disciples began to worship him. It wasn't that long ago that they were grieving. It wasn't that long ago that they were hiding for fear of the Jewish authorities. But now they're beginning to worship him. In John 16, verse 20, Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. And so as they're worshiping him, notice some doubted. Now that wouldn't have been his apostles who were doubting. This particular event here recorded in Matthew actually takes place over a week after his resurrection. In John 20, verses 19 through 29, uh, John says that Jesus was uh, with his apostles on two occasions over eight days. And that had occurred in the city of Jerusalem. So that means that Matthew is saying that Jesus met his men sometime later in northern Israel, in Galilee. So those who are mentioned as doubting are not the apostles. They would have been other followers of Jesus who had also come to the place. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 6. Paul said, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So the ones that are being referred to here uh, are, are the ones who are amongst those 500, and some are doubting. It's just too good to be true. Perhaps they're a distance away and really don't recognize them. But there they are. And now we look at this commission, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, 
All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Great Commission, let's look at that together. Before sending them, notice with me, he makes a statement, verse 18, all authority has been given unto me. All authority is his because he's Messiah. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And Jesus says, I have authority and I am sending you. Notice verse 19, go. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations. By my authority, I am sending you on a mission. And the mission I am authorizing you to perform is the task of making disciples. Right now, there is a war going on there is a fight going on, and some of us are not aware of it. It's even bigger than Mayweather McGregor. <laughs> where they were saying, send us your money, so... Anyway, uh, <laughs> that was humorous. But um, it's a huge fight. It's an enormous one, and it's for human souls. And the church has been given a commission. You need to go and you need to declare these things to the people. Why? Because Jesus Christ died, was buried, resurrected. He brings life. And it's his message of life that you're to communicate to people so that they might be set free from the bondage of sin. And so instead of remaining here in the city of Jerusalem, your commission is to go out. Your commission, or remaining in the city of Jerusalem, your commission is to go out and do the work of ministry. Why? Because you have a message that sets people free. And it's not something that is simply to be a local thing. It's not just for the Jews in Israel. This is a, a message that's to go worldwide. The task of making disciples is not just for the nation, but it's for the entire world. You see, Jesus intended his men to make disciples. He didn't intend his men to go out and, and convince people to refer to themselves as Christians. Because a lot of people here in the United States and in many places of the world, when you ask them, what is your religious faith, will immediately say, well, I was baptized or I'm a Christian. He didn't say go out and make nominal Christians, people who refer to themselves as Christian on, on different surveys and all. He's saying, I want you to make disciples. And there's a difference between somebody who communicates and says, I am a, a Christian and, and a genuine Christian because a genuine Christian has certain earmarks. And a cultural Christian simply refers to themselves as a Christian. A, a disciple is somebody who is fully committed to Jesus Christ. So when the Lord is speaking concerning making disciples, he is saying, go out and make disciples, not deciders. Because there are a lot of people today who refer to themselves as believers who I'm referring to as deciders. Oh, I've decided a certain thing. But are you a disciple? Do you understand what it means to follow Christ? You see, in Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And not everybody does that. There are a lot of people who are convenient Christians. It's Easter, we go to church. It's Christmas, we go to church. It's a wedding, we go to church. It's a baptism, we go to church. It's a funeral, we go to church. But that's what we do. If there's not something else to do, well, I don't even have to, quote unquote, go to church anymore. I just look up church services in different places. So I like worship at a certain place and I'll watch their worship service. Then I'll tune into somebody else's live teaching service and we're selective and we sit back and we watch TV and we take in information the way we do with our phones and our iPads and all. And what we simply do is we just take in information and we say that we're serving the Lord when in reality, we're not even committed enough to get up and go somewhere. He says what we need to do is pick up our cross. You see, in, in Jesus' day, certain earmarks identified a person as a disciple. It, it, it was similar to what we used to have uh, where you had, an, you had a, a, a master and an apprentice, a mentoring relationship. And, and Jesus, when he was speaking of people being his disciples, 
there was a Jewish form of mentoring that he was referring to because during his day, a disciple had certain earmarks. Uh, he decided to follow a teacher. The disciple would memorize the words of the teacher. The disciple would learn his way of ministry from the teacher. The disciple would imitate the life and character of their teacher. And then when they were fully committed as real disciples, they would raise up their own disciples. You can still see that in Israel. The first, day, the first time I went to Israel was back in 1983. And I was standing at what is called the Western Wall. And I was standing next to my pastor, Chuck Smith. And as I was standing next to Pastor Chuck, I was noticing that these rabbinic students would go to the Western Wall and they would pray there. And they had different behaviors. I mean, some of them would stand straight and they were bowing forward very quickly. And then others were standing straight but they were moving side to side, and I was fascinated to watch that. And I asked my pastor, what are they doing? And he said, they are imitating their master. He said, they have a rabbi who has taught them to pray in that fashion, and that's what they're doing. He said, the word of God says, to love the Lord thy God with all your strength. And so when they're praying, they're moving back and forth because they're loving God with their strength. So to this day, you can go to Israel and still see what I'm referring to here when it's to become like the master, because they would learn the way of service to God by watching and by imitating. And they, they would also memorize the words of that master. And well, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. So they would memorize the words. They would learn his way of ministry. Uh, it says in Matthew 10, 25, it's enough for a disciple that he'd be like his teacher. But they also were intended to raise up disciples. Certain point, we no longer follow that exact example, but you will become that example to somebody else. And that's what the Lord is teaching them to do. Now let me get practical. In my Christian life, when I first got saved, I was taught to do the work of an evangelist. When you look in the Bible, it's interesting to note that there's what is called the office of evangelist. You see that in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. But there is doing the work of an evangelist that you see in 2 Timothy chapter 4. There's only one person in the Bible ever referred to as an evangelist, and that's Philip the evangelist. But all of us are called to do the work of evangelism. You see, when I first got saved, I was told, this is what you need to do if you want to grow. It's the same thing we all need to do. Read the word, learn to pray, fellowship with other Christians, and tell somebody about your faith in Christ. That's what led me to read the Bible and bring my family to Christ. But it was easier for me to talk to my family than it was to just people I didn't know. And yet my friends hauled me out on Whittier Boulevard to go and talk to people, strangers. And I'm not somebody who can do that very well. To this day, I'm still a little reserved in that. I, I don't speak to strangers very easily. Some do. Some do. Some can can speak to strangers, and, and uh, before you know it, they're like best friends. My wife Marie's that way, but I'm not. I'm kind of reserved. I'm very reserved. But when the Lord opens the door, I will speak. But as a brand new Christian, I'm just saved. I don't even know the names of the books of the Bible yet. I, I can't pronounce the word Ecclesiastes. I've got no clue what, what you're talking about. All I know is I was blind. Now I see. I was deaf. Now I hear. All I know is I was crippled, now I walk. That's pretty much what I know. I was a sinner, now I'm saved. I'm going to heaven, was going to hell. I knew those things. So they're taking me on Whittier Boulevard. And as I'm walking on Whittier Boulevard, we go to Bob's Big Boy. You guys ever hear of Bob's Big Boy? Bob's Big Boy. On Whittier Boulevard, in Whittier. Come on, Dave, let's talk to people about Jesus. Are you kidding me? I don't know how to do that. Let me just stand next to you and nod my head and smile and look up to heaven like, oh, that's true. But to, 
But to talk to people, so I still remember going into the parking lot at Bob's Big Boy and approaching a truck, and the truck, well, in the truck was a friend of mine named Jeff. And Jeff and I were friends from high school, and I was 20 years old now. I hadn't seen him for a while, but he and I used to party a lot. He was a drunk, so was I. We got along very well. There he was in the truck, and I thought, oh, this has got to be God, because I can speak to friends. I just haven't learned to speak to strangers. I still remember walking up to Jeff and saying to him, hey, Jeff, how you doing? He says, Dave, how are you? And I said, I'm great, Jeff. I said, I just want to talk to you for a minute. He said, good, I haven't seen you in a long time and all of that. And I said, no, I haven't. But let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you that I gave my heart to Christ and I've been born again, Jeff. He was drunk. He was, he was real drunk. And he looks at me in his drunk, slurred speech, and he says, you're born again? And I said, yeah. He says, so am I. Let's have a drink and talk about it. I mean, as he, as he <laughs> so am I. And, and I thought, you know what? There's got to be more to the Christian life than just saying you're a Christian. And and it, it's very difficult to speak to somebody who's inebriated about the things of the Lord, but that's when I began to learn how to, to communicate in all of that. And I have to tell you that in, in the season I got saved, it was the Jesus movement. In the Jesus movement, it was a, a revival. A, a few years before the movement, there was a, an article that was put out with a, a, the question, I, I think it was in either, it was Time Magazine, and it said, is God dead? And then a few years later, you have uh, another headline where it's got Jesus' face and it says, Jesus revolution. And so I came out of that. I came out of a revolution. I came out of a, of a time when you tell people about the Lord. You, you ask God for the power of the Holy Spirit and you communicate to them what God has done. That's what I came out of. And as I came out of that, I began to realize that you need to tell people about Jesus Christ. You need to go out and be concerned about them and explain to them what the Lord's doing. And, and it's amazing how God was working at that time because there were songs that were being played on the radio that had Christian themes. And even people who were not saved would say things that alluded to Christian activity. There was a guy by the name of Elton John. Some of you may have done your studies in ancient musical history. Elton John. And Elton John had a, a song out called Levon. And some of you may remember some of the words in it because it says, Jesus freaks out in the streets, handing tickets out for God. What was he talking about? He was talking about Jesus freaks. That's what they called us, Jesus freaks. What are the tickets he's referring to? We would give tracks out. And apparently somebody had written a song that he sang making making a statement concerning what they were seeing in Hollywood because we would, a lot of the people would go on caravan to Hollywood Boulevard and would walk up and down and would share the gospel. Arthur Blessed, uh, an evangelist, the guy who gave the message I got saved listening to, Arthur Blessed was, was hanging on a cross. He would hang himself on a cross on Hollywood Boulevard. And people would walk by and he would say, are you ready for God? And the people would look at him and say, we're not even ready for you. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but that's what he did. And it was something that they had the Hollywood Free Press, and then they had the Hollywood paper that was for Christian, the Christian Times. And, and there were different things that were happening that were so powerful. Why? Because we knew that Jesus Christ said, go and tell them about me. And that's what we did. We didn't rely on some evangelist. We did it ourselves. That's how this church was birthed. That's how 1,800 Calvary chapels, because we were told, go out and tell someone about Jesus Christ. That's why we did it. Jesus is the way to heaven, we would say. There's no salvation in anyone else, we would tell them. You need to know Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, go. You see, remember that in, in, in the Jewish religion, the Jews had built the temple. And the male adults over a certain age were required, if they were able, to come for three major festivals over the course of the calendar year. They went to temple. But now we become the temple of the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God dwells in us and the temple goes to the people. So he says, go. We preach a message.
that is remarkable in its power of transformation. There's a guy I know. His name is Kilroy, one of the originators of the Mexican Mafia. Kilroy. Some of you know his name. Some of you may know him. Kilroy. Kilroy was released from prison. He was in his front yard. He was watering the yard with the garden hose. That's a Mexican sprinkling system. <laughs> I'm Mexican, okay? Some of you don't know that. I'm plain. You'll be lining up to stab me after church. <laughs> He's watering the lawn. When a car comes driving by, very slowly, what do you do when you see a car out of the corner of the eye going slowly by you? He sees a car coming by slowly, so he's watching it, and it stops. Makes a U-turn, comes back, watering his lawn, watching it from the corner of his eye. Stops, turns around, comes back, and pulls over at his curb. A woman in her 70s climbs out and walks up to Kilroy and says to him, I know who you are. And I'm not afraid of you. You need Jesus. And she wins him to Christ. She used to go to our church. She brings Kilroy to church here. And Kilroy was in our church for some time, learning about Jesus Christ. Why? Because God changes lives through the gospel. That's how it happened. Talking to a man, talking to a man's wife. And she starts telling me his testimony. She says he was 12 years old when his mom died. It's now Thanksgiving. He's getting ready for Thanksgiving dinner, so his father walks into his room and says to him, what are you doing? This 12-year-old little boy says, I'm getting ready to go Thanksgiving at Auntie's house. The father says, who invited you? You're not going. Gives him $2 and says, go, to, go and get yourself a hamburger. Takes a family, leaves this little 12-year-old by himself, mourning his mother's death in his bedroom. The little boy eventually just says, I can't handle this, and he runs away, starts living in an alley. He starts sweeping a bakery Monday through Friday so that the guy who owns the bakery will give to him a donut and milk for his breakfast. He eventually just gets into the gangs because that's where his family is. He now has a family, it's a gang. Lives in East LA. Meets a girl, marries her, they have a baby. He moves to another state with his wife and child. He gets a job, but he has to leave for a few days during the week. She's pregnant with the second child, four-year-old little girl. He gets a call while he's at work in this other state. It's a friend who says to him, you ought to come home a little early. Your wife's going out on you. He gets in his car, comes, a, comes home a day early, goes to his house, and she's not around. So he figures she must be where we normally go to a particular place, a restaurant. And he drives to the restaurant. There's his car. There's his wife. There's his little girl. And there's this motorcycle gangster, part of the banditos. And he's talking to his wife. And this guy gets out of his car. And he walks up to the bandito, and the bandito pulls a gun. And he shoots his four-year-old. And he shoots his wife. Jumps on his motorcycle, drives away. This man kneels down, picks up his four-year-old as she dies in his arms. 
and he sees his wife bloodied. Puts the wife in the hospital. Finds out where this guy is who shot her and shot and killed his baby. And he drives to this other state and he finds the safe house that this bandito's in. And he kills him. Kills him. Gets in his car and drives home. They extradite him. They actually said, you can come on your own. He came late. He stands before the judge and the judge says, because you didn't come on the date that you were ordered to appear, I have to sentence you to the full extent that this crime warrants 16 years prison. He goes to prison. In prison, he's remembering some of the things he heard before he went to prison. He had heard the gospel because he had gone to the Calvary Chapel there in Costa Mesa. He had heard the gospel. And he starts wondering about it. He gets out of prison, starts a job, and no longer married to the woman who had committed adultery because the baby was not his, it was this gangster's. He's divorced and he's living single and he begins to pray and he starts saying to God, can you please work in my life? I don't want to be alone all my life. I would like a wife. But I'm not going to chase anybody down. I'm just going to wait on you. He's a construction. He owns a construction company. So he starts going door to door through neighborhoods and he's giving them a card and he knocks on a door. A young woman opens the door and he says, do you need any work done? And she says, as a matter of fact, I do. This is the woman who told me the story. So he comes in and sits down and he asks her, um, what do you do? You know, keep yourself busy. She says, uh, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I, I serve and love the Lord. He says, I am too. He says, and I prayed because I'm looking for a church. Do you recommend yours? And she said, yes. He says, oh, really, where's it at? She tells him. That's like on a Monday. Wednesday, she goes to church, and there's this guy at church. He sees her and walks up. Hi, how are you? Thank you for recommending it. I loved it. I'm going to come back. She says, that's great. The next week, she goes on Sunday, and there he is walking by. Hi, how are you? Fine. Eventually, they go out for coffee. He's serving the Lord loving God. She's serving the Lord, loving God. His life has been transformed by a gospel. He wants to serve the Lord. She wants to serve the Lord. God placed them together. And a few months ago, I married him. It's my sister and her husband. The gospel. The gospel. The gospel transforms lives. Never forget that. That's why we preach the gospel. People need to know the grace of God who transforms sinners and gives them hope, who makes them brand new, because that's what Jesus Christ said that he would do. He changes our lives. And that's why we tell people about him Huh. I asked him today, I spoke to him, his name is Frank. I said, Frank, do you mind if I share a bit of your story with my church? It's just so stirring. And he said, please do, and then send me money. <laughs> <laughs> Paul was in the city of, A of uh, Athens, and he was awaiting two of his co-workers, uh, Timothy and Silas, and and as he was there, he, he seen the condition of the city. It says in Acts 17, 16, and 17, while, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. His his spirit was stirred that they were given over to idolatry, and it was enough to provoke him to share. 
It's like when the woman at the well who had been set free by Jesus in John chapter 4 after her conversation experienced freedom and the freedom she experienced that Christ brought uh, motivated her to go out and share. John 4, 4, 28 and 29 says, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? You see, this opportunity to invite people to see Jesus goes on to this day. It, it simply takes an experience with God and a concern for others to provoke you to share. In John 4, 35, Jesus said, do you not say four months more and then harvest? I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. So he says, go, and he ha you have a task. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. In other words, the salt needs to get out of the salt shaker. Your responsibility is not merely to travel the world as tourists. Now, this would be an amazing command alone because these are men who'd never even left Israel, and now he's saying, you're going to go throughout the world, but I've got a commission for you. You're going to do something. You're going to teach all nations. You're going to make disciples. You're going to teach them, according to verse 20, to observe all things. You're going to teach them systematically. You're going to communicate to them the counsel of God. It'll transform their lives. In Acts 20, 27, Paul said it like this, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And that's why we teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, because that's how you get the whole counsel of God. Ephesians 4, 11 through 14 says it like this, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. He's saying when you get the whole counsel, you, come, you become mature. You're to be like a newborn baby, desiring the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby if you've tasted that the Lord is good. And you're to be built on something more than opinions and experience and instincts. You're to be built on the solid rock of God's word because it's God's word that changes us and it's God's word that directs us and it's God's word that strengthens us. In Acts 20, 32, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Listen, in our day, we are experiencing what Paul predicted what he prophesied would occur. We are living in the last days that Paul told us about. We're living in those very days in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, that Paul spoke about. He spoke to a, a pastor by the name of Timothy, and he said this to him. He said, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience, careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. They will, and we're living in those days right now where healthy Bible studies people don't want. They want entertainment. They want music. They want everything but the word, because when the word is rightly divided, when you systematically approach it from Genesis to Revelation, you're going to give things that are warnings and you're going to give things that are blessings. You're going to have the whole package. But people don't want the whole package. What they want is they want like a pill right now. I want to feel good about who I am and what I'm doing. I don't want to hear that my lifestyle is not pleasing to the Lord. And, and when you say something to me that makes me uncomfortable, then you're a hater and I don't want to hear that. And that's where the church is today. And Paul said, listen, the day's going to come. They're no longer going to put up with healthy teaching. They don't want to hear it. They don't want the full counsel of God. They're not desirous of that. They're going to say, make me feel good. Say things that, that, that tickle my ear. Say things I already agree with. Um, you know, I, I spent five minutes in the Bible. I can, I can see that it agrees with me. So why are you saying things to me that cause me disturbance? 
We're living in that moment. Listen, the Jesus movement, a powerful movement that I alluded to, that I believe that God wants to do even a greater work in these last days, that Jesus movement was undermined at a certain point in history. And I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how I'm a veteran. I came from it. I can tell you how. There were a few things. I'll only give you a couple of things. But one of the things that undermined the movement of the Spirit of God came in an interesting way. It came through what was called the moral majority, through Jerry Falwell, who was a good man. And this is a man who, who loved the Lord. He had a, a great and very powerful work. But what happened is during the 70s, we began to be convinced that we could change the United States by electing officials who were righteous. And we stopped preaching. We stopped sharing. We stopped telling people the real answer is repentance. This nation needs to wake up. And we began to trust our elected officials to do that for us. The second thing that I saw happen was the proliferation of Christian TV programs. Because instead of teaching, we began to entertain through TV. And as we did that, we began to welcome false teachers into pulpits that were not only now affecting just a group of people that they were speaking to, but now an entire nation. And then it became international. And what happened is we began to rely on these kinds of things and we stepped away from the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to wake up again, guys. We need to come back to the word and the power of the Spirit. We do. We do. It's not too late but we need to do so. You see, it's the whole counsel of God that produces disciples. He did not say, go out and trust somebody else to be the evangelist. He said, you be the evangelist. You have family members that pastors like me will never be able to speak to. You do. You speak to them. They'll never come here, Greg, Lori. They're not going to watch TV and watch a Billy Graham crusade. They're watching you. They're listening to you. They want to know how it really works in you. Because any polished speaker can give a presentation articulate and eloquent if they work at it. But they don't want to hear a polished presentation. They want to see God's word incarnated. They want to see how that really works in a person they know. That's one of the things my dad told me that convinced him that he needed to listen to his son, his wayward son, when I began to share with him about Christ. He said, you needed God. And I saw what he did in your life. You were a living letter of God to me because you were my son. I knew the way you lived. And when you changed, that drew my attention. Your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors, you may not know it, but they do notice you. They do notice you. They are aware of you. They talk to you. On the job, when someone's telling a filthy joke and you're laughing along with them and acting like it's cool, they notice that. And as they notice that, they don't respect you. When I was in the army, 20 years old, new believer, I had a friend, his name was Levertis Hampton. Levertis Hampton. Levertis was a guy who was about five foot six, 200 pounds, solid rock muscle. And he was, he was a very bad dude. He hated my friend Salinas. And one day he was talking to Salinas, and Salinas was talking back to him. Salinas, the little guy, Levertis took his hand and grabbed hold of uh, a, uh, it was a light switch that was attached to the wall with, uh, with uh, deep screws. And while he was looking at Salinas, he pulled it off the wall. He wanted to kill Salinas, but he pulled it off the wall. Salinas said, man's crazy, man. Stay away from him. But he liked me. He liked me some, for some reason. And, and, I, and I took my liberty with Levertis. And I would talk to him about the Lord. Levertis was an African-American man. And he would come and he would talk to me about prejudice and about hatred. And, and, I, and I would say, and my friend saw me do this. I'd say to him, Levertis, I'd say, you want to know something, man? What? 
I said, you're a bigot. He goes, what? What? I said, you're a bigot. I said, man, you hate people. You need Jesus Christ. You need to get right with God because your heart's bad. And my friends, well, I would say, you shouldn't talk to Libertines. He'll take your head off. And I said, you know what? I've got favor with him. And I'm going to tell him the truth. And I would tell Libertines about that. And one day he walks in and he sits down with me and he says, Dave, I want you to know something, man. I got my heart right with God. I met a great girl. I'm going to church now. You got to tell them the truth. <laughs> tell them the truth. Love them. And if God gives you favor, if God gives you favor, use it for the glory of God. Use it for the glory of God. Jesus said, go out into all the world, make disciples. He said, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, and lo, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the age. Jesus will be with us. He says, until I come to judge the world, until I come to rule on earth, I will be with you. So as you go, and when you go, and while you go, and where you go, make disciples. And I will be with you. And you can't do it on the power of your persuasive speech. I will give to you power. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So go in the power of my might. Take my word. You are not alone. I'll be with you. And then I will come and rule and reign, and you will be by my side. Is there anything better than that? I say no. <laughs> Nothing better than that. Go. Go and share the gospel.